All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the North Central IPM Center's Pest and Progress webinar series. Um, today's webinar is titled Multi-State Extension Crop Protection Network with Adam Sisson. I am Lene Jess, I'm one of the co-directors of the North Central IPM Center, and we are one of four regional IPM centers, and we're supported by the USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. Um, we're conducting this to allow PIs to uh, talk about their research and, and the programs that they've done. If you have questions, we'd like you to type them in the Q&A that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end, um, I will read those to Adam and he can answer them at that time. So today, again, I want to welcome Adam. Adam Sisson. He's with Iowa State University and he, his title is Industry Extension Specialist. And again, he's going to be talking about the Multi-State Extension Crop Protection Network. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Lene, for the introduction. Um, uh, like Lene said, my name is Adam Sisson. I'm part of the Integrated Pest Management Program at Iowa State University. That uh, program is led by Dr. Darren Mueller, who's an extension plant pathologist at Iowa State as well. He is a um, co-director of the Crop Protection Network, and um, he can be followed on Twitter there, or you can follow the Crop Protection Network on Twitter uh, at either of those handles at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I, I want to say that this is a project update for the USDA NIFA CPPM award, and we're just going to be focusing on one aspect of this work, which is the Crop Protection Network. As part of the IPM program at Iowa State, we do lots of other work, but this, this, this part of it, the Crop Protection Network, is one of my favorites, and it has an impact well beyond Iowa. Um, So I want to start with an introduction. Um, like I born and raised in Iowa. I've been working at the university since 2010. And I started actually as an undergraduate hourly in the department all the way back in 2003. So I got a little bit of history with the plant path department here. Uh, in the very center of the picture at the top is my beautiful bride, Jen. And on either side of her are two of my kids, Jack and Eloise. And then if you follow to the side of the screen where that white chicken is, that white fluffy chicken, there's my son, Rowan, and another picture of Eloise. And then on the opposite side of the screen is uh, my daughter, Catherine, and yours truly. Now, having a pile of kids at home is great, but I'm certainly thankful for my wife and the teamwork that exists between us to manage this crew. Now, we also have a pile of this at home. Uh, these are uh, the 10 kittens that we currently have. Uh, we went from having four cats to uh, 10, uh, 14 cats very, very quickly. And uh, this is a cute pile, but it's also a messy pile. Uh, and so uh, this is, uh, this kitten issue is best managed as a team effort, as you can, as you can see here. And this kind of in a roundabout way brings me to my main point that teamwork among extension specialists to help with the pile of pest management problems that are faced is a good thing. So teamwork is good. Why multi-state extension? Um, like, yeah, raw, raw teamwork, but there's also some unromantic sides to multi-state extension as well. And that includes that it's mandated by the uh, um, United States Department of Agriculture and administration. Uh, multi-state extension looks good on large funding proposals, and it also can minimize re redundancy so that each state isn't producing similar materials on the same topic uh, with information that could be used across state lines. The outputs that are produced with multi-state extension efforts uh, have more power. There's more voices saying the same thing behind the message. And they also have more accuracy because there are more experts, more scientists looking at the information to make sure that it is correct before it goes out to the end user. And the end user, uh, there's, they live in a wider geographic area. And, and so in, instead of having just one, um, uh, one resource for Iowa, you have a resource that has wide regional and even national applicability. And so the story of the particular multi-state extension effort, the Crop Protection Network that I'm gonna be talking about today had its start over 15 years ago with soybean rust, uh, which is a, uh, pathogen that uh, was thought to have arrived in 2004 uh, in the continental U.S., blown up on Hurricane Ivan, uh, there was a massive effort, a massive multi-state effort to try to manage this disease to help people get ready for it, it included multi-state tracking of spores, predicting movement, 
uh, there was multi-state extension efforts that included developing maps, scouting information, sentinel plots, a uh, program called iPipe, and the development of something called the Soybean Rust Bible. But the question arose, who is going to house these outputs? Um, the soybean checkoff was originally tried, but it, at the time they didn't want to get involved with extension marketing. Um, E-Extension, a national effort, um, didn't work for us either. And we even tried the American Phytopathological Society, and they were not equipped to help out with the extension in the capacity that was needed. And Ohio State took the lead on the Soybean Rust Bible, and they largely faced challenges alone. And so uh, everyone mostly did their own thing. And, and so this revealed that there was no sustainable model for filing away the most important outputs. Uh, and perhaps a good analogy is building a house where the wood and the concrete and the shingles and all the items show up on site, but there's really no blueprints to follow to put everything together into something bigger. And also it's one crop pest among many potential issues. Soybean rust was only one thing. Uh, Invasive species would eventually arrive, weather patterns change, and existing threats become more of a problem. Uh, I think more recently of tar spot, which showed up in the US five or so years ago. Uh, and, and so this was a massive effort devoted to one pathogen. Um, and, and, and so there was a group of people who wanted to who were thinking about how to uh, form something that met their needs. And, and, and so an and, and, and organization that met their needs. And so in 2011, uh, this group of people, uh, Darren Mueller was part of it, asked administrators to identify multi-state extension models that, uh, that they knew of. And there was a few projects that existed, such as the Soybean Cis Nematode Coalition, but nothing really for uh, organizations or within crop disciplines that they knew of. And the Soybean Cis Nematode Coalition is good, but it's single, single topic focused not on broader disease issues in soybean or even broader pest issues in field crops in general. There was a water quality initiative called the North Central Region Water Network that was established by extension directors, uh, but the funding is dwindled and is, is now gone. There was an organization that was actually started back in around 1930 and uh, and uh, it's an educational example, and they publish uh, outreach, but nothing's really gone on in the past 10 plus years. And there's also e-extension. It has good resources, but uh, it, has, it has dwindled a bit. So um, in essence, they didn't think that there was a policy or even good guidelines on how to label collaborative publications. And so this group of people decided to build an organization. And so questions that were asked were, what is important to an extension specialist? What is important to our colleagues? So uh, that, that, that includes that outputs are unbiased and accurate. Uh, everyone knows that time and money are limited no matter, no matter what kind of organization you're a part of. Uh, peer review definitely helps with promotion of items and uh, extension specialists need to be able to report their activities to administration. And then also what is important to the stakeholders, the people who are, who are the audience, um, and that's the farmer or ag professional. And again, there it's that this stuff be, un, that, that the resources produced or the organization be unbiased and accurate. And also the information needs to be easy to access and understand, and also it needs to be high quality in nature. And so these questions kind of focused on, 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 uh, looking looking sideways, not looking upwards. And, and so some of those questions that weren't asked that looked upwards included, who's going to pay for this thing that we want to bank? That's an important question. What kind of legal protection will the universities offer the, this, uh, potential or, or this potential organization? And what is important to administration? So as organizations started in 2014, um, some of the issues that were brought up included what are things that many states are doing, what is redundant between states, and that's background information about diseases, images of diseases, and what multi-state pieces that are being done need a home. And this included um, disease loss estimates and fungicide efficacy charts, which I will talk about a little bit later. So now we'll finally get to uh, uh, the Crop Protection Network. Uh, it took 
it took a lot of work by Darren and colleagues to get this thing off the ground. But uh, through the story of soybean rust and discussions afterwards, uh, the Crop Protection Network was officially launched. And you can see uh, that it's directed by several people. Um, uh, Darren, Kirsten Wise out of the University of Kentucky and Albert Snuda at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. There's an executive committee that's formed by um, lots of different folks from different states. And then there's the communications crew of which I am a part of it. Um, there, this is the people who are leading it and who are doing some of the communications efforts, but really CPN has been a huge team effort by lots of people over, over multiple years to try to put together the resources that we have in place. And I'm gonna talk about those resources in a little bit. And, and I also just wanted to say that CPN formed prior to the CPPM funding that we're talking about today, and we'll continue to move forward even after the end of that grant. So some of the things that I'm gonna talk about here are for the life of CPN, rather than just what happened during the grant period. Uh, but the EIP reporting, the CPPM reporting period was a resource of growth and funding for the development of, of uh, CPN. And I wanted to throw that in as we move forward here. So what is the Crop Protection Network? It is a product of land-grant universities. We want people to recognize that, and it's right in the logo, that CPN, the Crop Protection Network, is from land-grant universities. And ultimately, it's an infrastructure for collaborative multi-state outputs among universities and extension specialists. With the audience being farmers, agribusiness personnel, and even other extension agents, it is a better way to extend results of multi-state research products. Um, it's a single house for these things. Uh, it's flexible and responsive to new research and changing agricultural practices. And the goals of the Crop Protection Network are to create resources and tools for stakeholders, to minimize the duplication of efforts, uh, to combine knowledge for stronger outputs, meeting some of those uh, things that we first discussed at the beginning of the presentation, creating resources that can be updated quickly and frequently because they're online, uh, to save money when budgets are limited. Not everyone has to make the same publication on Tarspot in each of their states. They can get together and make one single publication on Tarspot using it as an example. And then there's already a place for this to be housed. There's a place that uh, they can direct their stakeholders to. It's also to help new extension specialists. Um, that kind of relates to what I just talked about. Um, a new extension specialist may have an issue in their state, but they don't have the resources to produce something to help educate their state. They can work with the Crop Protection Network or direct people back to the Crop Protection Network's resources. So, so far, there's been over 190 specialists from 34 U.S. states and two Canadian provinces that have been involved so far. And this goes back to saying that there has been a lot of people to help uh, uh, get this resource together and to make it and to make it what it is. The resources are primarily housed at cropprotectionnetwork.org. So if you've got another screen open, you can go to that and check some stuff out as as I'm talking about it. But um, the outputs are housed here. We've got lots of different things, publications, tools, other educational resources. And uh, we also link to uh, the extension websites uh, of universities here. And that can be found by going up to the about at the top of the screen. So, so far uh, we have an encyclopedia of, of uh, crop pests, mostly just uh, diseases and a few insects at this time for soybean, corn, alfalfa, and wheat. And there's about 150 of them. And these are what we call our encyclopedia articles. And it's a keyword sortable encyclopedia. And you can go to this and, 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 and search by alfalfa pests or corn diseases that, uh, and then you can also search by plant part that is being affected by that particular pest. And, and so there's lots of images there, basic scouting information and general management. And, and so there's been nearly 800,000 visit, eight, nearly 800,000 visits to CPN encyclopedia articles since 2019. There are 80 plus publications on a variety of topics. We'll go through those a little bit later. And over 250,000 publications have been downloaded or viewed since 2018. And in 2021, we released our first web book on crop scouting and corn and soybeans. We also put together annual corn, soybean, and wheat disease loss estimates for the U.S. and Canada. We summarized these into uh, smaller fact sheets that have basic information on, on, on what was seen that year. But we also use that data combined with USDA uh, NAS data and input it into an online tool for calculating losses so that people can figure out 
uh, more specific more specific information. Say, for example, someone wants to figure out uh, the impact that frog eye leaf spot of soybean had in three states from 2012 through uh, 2020. They can put that into the online calculator and get that information. We have a severity estimate tool, which is it's it's, it's essentially visual training for disease severity estimations and insect foliation estimations, and it can help people to uh, um, become more consistent at their at their estimation skills. Uh, we help certified crop advisors obtain continuing education units. Uh, there's a about 50 exams, uh, and the exams are based on the Crop Protection Network publications or webinars. And, and so far, there's been more than 7,000 quiz attempts since we released this tool. We started a podcast in 2021 called I See Dead Plants. And we have a virtual crop scout school that also started last year. Uh, it began with 22 learning presentations. And this year, we increased the number by adding a few more topics. There are 12 webinars in the series so far. And we have a monthly newsletter. Uh, if you don't have the time to go to the Crop Protection Network website, and be looking for new items, go there once, sign up for the newsletter, subscribe to it, and it'll come right to your inbox and you can see what's uh, new with the Crop Protection Network uh, directly in your, in your inbox by signing up. There's multiple different kinds of publication types. The first one is a full length publication. You can see an example there. It's an overview of tar spot and there's multiple other ones in this same category that give a uh, slightly detailed uh, background and information about a particular topic or disease. And it'll talk a little bit about the history, show lots of high quality images. It'll go into management, uh, signs and symptoms. And it will also show oftentimes lookalikes so that people can help to avoid confusion between that particular disease and other uh, diseases or disorders or insect injury that may look that 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 may look similar. We've got lots of contributors, lots of uh, state contributors to these publications. There's also fungicide efficacy guides, and you can see a portion of one at the top of the screen there. And that is the result of research of research efforts across the country. Um, lots of different plant pathologists who do research uh, combine the knowledge into these efficacy guides. There's one on uh, corn foliar diseases. There's one on soybean foliar diseases wheat diseases and soybean seedling diseases. And uh, they rate the various fungicide active ingredients on how well they'll manage certain pathogens. And that's one of the most popular publication types that we have on the webpage. We do annual disease loss estimates, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are a few uh, plant pathologists who, and, and, and entomologists now, or an entomologist now that query um, their various uh, colleagues and states to get information on how much disease loss did you have in your state in this year? And they break it down by disease as well. And so we collect all this information and uh, um, summarize it uh, in, in, in these publications and also add it on the calculator. We have one page short communications on cover crops or fungicide resistance, uh, just uh, shorter topics. We also do timely articles on seasonal issues. And one of the newer things that we do is research reviews. And, and, and these take scientific manuscripts and rewrite them in such a way that they're a little bit more accessible to say certified crop advisor audience or uh, agronomist audience who will then take that information and uh, give it to uh, their clientele. And it's a little bit more understandable, we hope, than um, the published works in the scientific manuscript by nature. We have seen continued resource growth uh, over the years. And uh, um, in 2020, we actually saw the number of corn publications that were downloaded or viewed um, uh, uh, eclipse those of soybean. And I think there's probably more soybean resources on the site, but something called tar spot came along. And I think that kind of tipped the scales on those uh, resources. Um, we have a I talked earlier about the disease loss estimates. Well, all of that information is gathered from the extension specialists in the various states, and it's combined with USDA data, and it's put into this disease and insect pest yield loss tool, which you see kind of the homepage of here. And in it, you can set the year that you want to query, uh, and you can also choose the disease or the disease category. You can choose 
uh, the geographic region or state or even multiple states uh, to query that data for. And, and so this is an example. I wanted to figure out uh, how much yield loss tar spot caused from 2019 to 2021 in Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. And this is part of the output. You can see that it shows a percent loss on a yearly basis from those three states in each of those years. It also shows the bushels lost and uh, the uh, US dollars that were lost. And something that I think is really cool is this per acre loss column all the way over on the side there. And that's just kind of a neat way to break it down. You can see these giant numbers, but it's helpful to see, oh, spread out over all the acres planted, tar spot resulted in this much yield loss on a per acre basis. We know it didn't affect everybody that way, but it just is a, a cool way to show how impactful uh, this particular disease or other diseases you might query are. This shows one of our, two of our crops, our web books. The first one we produced was at the beginning of last year, and it was the Crop Scouting Basics for Corn and Soybean. Went over a variety of topics that new crop scouts might need to know, ranging from growth stages in corn and soybean to essentials of entomology, plant pathology, weed science, and even going over some disorders. Another web book we have is Fungicide Use in Field Crops, and that also is a longer resource, uh, and it just gives the basics about fungicide use, the active ingredients, uh, fungicide terminology, spray patterns, etc. And so you can go to the web books on the on, on the page if you want to get a little bit uh, deeper look at, 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 at things such as uh, um, crop scouting or fungicide use. Now, this is a fun project we're doing. Uh, it's called the IC Dead Plants Podcast. It was started last year. Host Ed Zaworski interviews researchers about their recent scientific releases or uh, their particular field of interest. And uh, the names are kind of fun sometimes. Uh, you can see at the top of your screen there, we've got one podcast called Getting Fungicide All Up in My Canopy, which was about spray coverage in corn canopy. Uh, uh, and then also uh, the bottom one is Army of Fatherless Clones, which was on soybean aphid decision making. And if you know about, if you know anything about soybean aphids, you can understand that title. So yes, uh, episodes are uh, hopefully being released on a regular basis here. And so go to the website and uh, look under podcasts, and and you can also access these on Apple iTunes and uh, or excuse me, Apple Podcasts and uh, Spotify as well. So yes, please subscribe to that. Virtual Crop Scout School, it also covers a wide variety of essential topics for uh, new crop scouts. Um, there are multiple field crops and disciplines, how-to videos. Um, once again, covering uh, basic things like uh, vegetative or uh, staging in the field crops, as well as uh, insects um, and uh, uh, plant pathology and other topics like that. Uh, in 2021, we had 684 registrants for this webinar series, uh, and they re represented a good portion of the U.S., 34 states, and even uh, 24 countries outside of the U.S. Yes, we're on social media. We have a Twitter account, Crop Network. I mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation. Um, we uh, have high hopes for the future. We're looking to the future for social media growth and increased awareness of CPN resources. Um, Follow us uh, if you like to get your news on Twitter. Um, and we are also in the beginning phases of starting a Facebook page as well. So this wouldn't be possible uh, without all of the contributors uh, and especially wouldn't be possible without all of the uh, folks or uh, um, agencies that have helped to fund work so far. That includes infrastructural funding from commodity groups such as the United Soybean Board and the National Corn Growers Association and even the grain farmers of Ontario. Uh, some support comes through the North Central IPM Center uh, working groups. So thank you very much hosts today. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, right now that currently is the alfalfa pest management working group that is developing resources that will be housed and some of them already are housed on the Crop Protection Network. Uh, leveraged grant funds through commodity groups for specific projects, mostly publications or webinars. So for example, if someone was someone from Indiana or Illinois was uh, coming up with a presentation for a commodity group and they needed an extension component, they could uh, house that component on the Crop Protection Network website. We also have leveraged funds, funds from universities and primarily that's Iowa State and the University of Kentucky. And that's that includes USDA support through uh, the IPM programs. 
there are lots of challenges that we face, uh, in, including how can we improve marketing to our end users, our colleagues, and even university administrative leaders. Um, we want to be recognized as an extension resource. Um, how do we sell unbiased, relevant, and accurate information? We don't have a large marketing budget, and, and so we don't have a product to put behind that either. But I, I guess one of the strong points is that like, it is good information, and, 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 and we're not trying to sell a product that's associated with it. Uh, how are we selling to colleagues that cover different crops, such as alfalfa, or even different disciplines, such as entomology, or, or weed science, or agronomy? And, uh, and why would others want to use CPN for their outputs? There's interest from these other groups, but, but is our infrastructure able to support their needs, to support their projects? Um, and I just wanted to end with this slide saying like, there will be challenges and there are challenges. And we face plenty of challenges so far with the Crop Protection Network, but it's certainly worth it. Anyone who will know that if they've raised kids before. So with that, I wanted to say thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to happy to take them. All right. Thank you, Adam. I have a couple of questions. And if anybody else has any more questions, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, one of them is, what's been some of the most successful CPN projects done so far, in your opinion? Uh, so one of the most successful things is the efficacy guides, the fungicide efficacy guides. Those are um, uh, as evidenced by the uh, downloads or reviews of those of those guides. And so I think that's been one of the cool things um, and one of the most successful things that we've done so far. So I haven't looked at those, but are those by state then too? So you know what's registered in each state or is it just general? It's a general one. Um, I'm not sure, but I think sometimes that individual states can take that information and then tailor it for their needs, but it's just a general one at this point. Okay. And if somebody wants to kind of get involved or has um, a paper that they would they think should be done, how would they get involved and how would they who would they contact? Well, so right now we're currently working on a process to, I guess, make that more streamlined. But in the meantime, they can email either of the project directors, Darren Mueller or Kirsten Wise, to get a conversation started about that. All right. Thank you. And if, um, and, and, and if they were just to email Crop Protection Network at gmail.com, we would make sure that that request got to the appropriate people. So crop protection network at gmail.com. Great, that's an easy one to remember, so thank you. All right, since we're a little bit over time because of our IT issues, I think we're gonna go ahead and end with that then. Um, thank you, Adam, for being with us today. Um, and just a reminder again that our next webinar will be Wednesday, July 20th um, with the South Dakota State University um, while talking about their project. Again, if you want more information, you can go to our website at ncipmc.org. Uh, so thank you for joining us today and everybody have a great day.